Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Montras, Senior Curator, Interim Artistic Director here at Decordova Sculpture Park and Museum. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, my dear colleague, Sam Adams, a curatorial fellow here, and we are so um, delighted and honored to be joined by our incredible speaker today, Dr. Alex Zamalin. Um, Alex, if I can call you that, is Assistant of Professor of Political Science and Director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Detroit Mercy. Um, his publications include, if you can switch to the next slide, um, the subject of today's talk, really, um, Black Utopia, the History of an Idea from Black Nationalism to Afrofuturism, Anti-Racism, an Introduction, and Struggle on Their Minds, the Political Thought of African American Resistance. Um, and very excited also to share that, that your newest book is actually being released this week. Is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. Um, congratulations. Thank we you. have um, that title is Against Civility, the Hidden Racism in Our Obsession with Civility. And so if there's time also, we'd love to maybe even delve into that newest part of your research and work. Um, Sam and I invited Alex to offer insight and context and discussion around the subject of Black utopian thought um, in connection to the two exhibitions that are now on view at De Cordova. Um, Alex's book is actually really recent. So it was published in 2019 by Columbia University Press and it offers a groundbreaking, groundbreaking examination of African-American visions of utopia and their counter utopian counterparts. Um, taking the structure of chapters on different writers and thinkers and creatives from W.E.B. Du Bois, Octavia Butler, Samuel Delaney, and others, Utop a Black Utopia traces bold visions of emancipation and considers figures linked to racial separation, separatism, post-racialism, ra post anti-colonialism, and Afrofuturism, among other topics. Um, and so if Elizabeth, you can switch to the next slide just to again provide a brief sort of way of bridging both the subject of your research, Alex, and the content, select content in Visionary New England and Transcendental Modernism. These are two shows that are, have been up on view at De Cordova since um, October. Um, both delve into the history and legacy and impact on contemporary art of subjects of spiritualism, um, utopian communities and impulses and thought, um, animism and it's um, the ways in which people and think about and relate to an intimate relationship to nature and its agency. Um, all of those issues that sweat, that um, have developed and been part of New England's own regional formation and character. And so we often think of, um, sometimes people think about New England's um, definition as defined by its the Puritans or the colonial landing, you know, foundational narratives in this and this exhibition, both exhibitions actually push against what is uh, what are better known narratives of, of um, New England's uh, seekers. And it amplifies, I think, the voices and creatives of people who have been often marginalized or who sought alternative futures, alternative ways of um, creating community and reform. Um, if you can switch to the next slide. The art, the exhibition Visionary New England is um, structured around 12 contemporary artists and mingled within that are displays of historic material artifacts, archives, and um, artworks from earlier epo episodes. And so as you enter into the show, I just wanted to point out one or two artists in connection to Alex's um, talk. If you go to the next slide, this is the view into the main gallery. The first section, as you see on the right, is this vitrine. Um, and this section of the show deals with the subject of spiritualism, which was, um, which, uh, was and is a kind of popular religion devoted to communing with the dead, communing with one's ancestors, communing with the great beyond and um, those who, you know, communing with immaterial, intangible forces and how that has developed in artistic practice and otherwise. And so the first artist you see as you walk in, you might encounter if you go to the next slide, um, is this beautiful figurine sculpture by a Framingham artist, a Framingham based artist, African American artist named Meta Vo Warwick Fuller. And the piece is called Veiled Future. So she created this in 1914 um, after some years of training um, and living in Paris, where she actually did get to know W.E.B. Du Bois and other artists and writers who had left the United States to find a more fertile ground culturally and um, through their practice um, in, in Europe. 
um, she created this work at the same time as she was creating work that um, were far more overt in their anti-slavery and anti-racist themes. Um, but this particular work is more like an allegorical representation of a kind of Afro-American future that she envisioned. So she called it veiled future. It has this sort of symbolic allusion to a, a, um, someone looking looking longingly and being draped by a, a kind of shroud that keeps them sort of stuck in mystery, but looking up in anticipation. So there's a suggestion, I would say, of emancipation in this work, um, but it's something I'd love to um, hear more about through Alex's conversation and think more deeply about. But her uh, Medivo work, Fuller described her, that her work was of the soul rather than the figure. And so she even talks about some of her work as being um, channeling kind of connections or vibrations to her ancestors, some of whom were enslaved, have been enslaved. So the next slide, actually, if you can just forward to the next slide, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this portion, but we wanted to also just mention another video work that's upstairs in the galleries, uh, this incredible piece by Tourmaline, who was born in Boston, now based in New York, um, and who's created, if you just flip to the next slide, um, a kind of historic reenactment um, in a way of magical video that imagines um, Seneca Village. So Seneca Village in the 1820s, in the mid 1800s had formed and was inhabited by um, blacks, uh, black Americans and as well as um, an Irish immigrant communities in what is now um, Central Park. Um, at the time though, they lived there and owned land and in the 1850s, I believe it was that um, the New York um, removed them from their settlements under eminent domain. So at the time it sort of existed it, what seems to be almost it's like a, a free community, almost utopian in its um, in thinking. And so this video traces that, imagines this world, um, positions within it a transgender woman um, named Mary Jones and who discovers her power in the face of um, systemic racism and transphobia. So just two examples within Visionary, and then I'll pass over to Sam to point out a few examples uh, of um, work in connection to Alex's um, talk as well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and hello, everyone who's tuning in. I also just wanted to mention, please feel free to leave comments as things occur to you and also submit things to the Q&A um, feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll uh, get to them at the end of the talk. Um, or if it seems really, really urgent, we'll get to it right right now. Um, so the, the complementary exhibition, Transcendental Modernism, um, builds on those themes that Sarah just described in Visionary New England, um, and mostly looks in Decord of his permanent collection with some loans. Um, and I, and looking, and it looks at art in Massachusetts specifically, so not throughout all of New England. Um, and and focuses on the 1940s to 90s. And so in that period that, you know, the, the sort of pinnacle of that period is the 60s, 70s, the, the era of black liberation of the civil rights movement and of decolonization in Africa. And of which there is a lot of exchange between artists in Ghana and in Cameroon and South Africa with artists in Boston um, and artists locally looking really outside of the European tradition of art making. Um, so next slide. Um, this is a little view into the gallery. Uh, next slide. Um, so the section that I wanted to just bring out in this talk in the work in the context of your work, Alex, um, is called Af African American Visions of an Ancient Future. And it features three artists who are working in the Roxbury uh, neighborhood of Boston, very, very close to one another and actually within the same community. Um, very public facing artists, um, both in terms of th their works, like making murals in the public and also hosting sort of community celebrations, open studios. Um, pedagogy was a huge part of their, their practice, teaching, passing traditions on from generation to generation. Um, and actually uh, reading your book, Black Utopia was a, was a really important part of the research that I did going into this um, to, to mount this, this part of the exhibition. So next slide. Um, just to bring attention to a few of the, the works here that are so vibrant um, and so beautiful and so meticulously made. Uh, Napoleon Jones Henderson was um, one of the original members of Afrocobra, the African commune of bad relevant artists, which formed in Chicago in the late 60s. Um, and he moved to Roxbury um, on a, permanently in 1974. He, he still was actively working, teaching uh, young artists, mentoring people. Um, and making public art commissions, but 
On the left, there's a tapestry, which is handwoven by him on a loom of, um, of tribal um, figures from Sinufo sculptures that he's transformed, westernized, secularized, and they're sort of dancing in bell bottoms and platforms. Um, and so he's thinking of these sort of Sinufo figures in the US. And so really outside of linear history, outside of nor sort of standard um, normative histories of, of how hybridity and cultural exchange works. Um, and then on the right, this really magical piece is part of a, um, a, a trio of works about Duke Ellington's sacred concerts, which blend both spiritual and religious traditions. And so this sort of goes outside of the sort of Christian faith to, to, to look at spiritually, spirituality in a broader, not necessarily Western way. Next slide. Um, and there's a few mur murals that we reproduced um, for the exhibition with the artist's permission and their, um, and their help to understand what the work is about. So Sharon Dunn, um, a professor at Mass Art, um, painted this in 1970, Black women, as she was a young mother. And you can see these young Black mothers looking up at these sort of archetypes of Black womanhood into the sort of eyes of the ancestors above. And she was also uh, traveling all over the world looking at Egyptian tomb architecture, Nubian iconography. Um, next slide. And um, not too far from, from that and very close to where she was working and living at the time, Gary Rickson painted this mural on the side of the YMCA, Africa is the beginning. And it's still there today um, as is Sharon's uh, mural. And I have heard from so many young artists about how this inspired them to look outside of the Western tradition for like um, these sort of, both for artistic creativity and for spirituality. Next slide. And then finally, this is another painting by the same artist, uh, Gary Rickson, Our Son Has a Father, um, where he's looking, he's applying ideas of racial concepts to, um, and, and sort of concepts of black pride, black excellence, to actually thinking about the cosmos and outer space. Um, and the, the formation of our universe um, as not as uh, outer space is not a white space, essentially. Um, so those are some of the works that also are just um, our presentation of them is also informed by your scholarship, Alex. So, so we'll we'll sh unshare this presentation screen and ask Alex to to lead us through some some of the introductory ways in which what you're into the research of your book, and we're just excited and really excited to have you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sam. I'd like to thank the museum, the audience, all of you for coming out on a Thursday afternoon. I'm incredibly delighted to be here. And I'd like to say that it's really wonderful to be able to explore the relationship between politics, ideas, and aesthetics. The reason I started writing the book in the first place was after the 2016 election and this real pessimism that I saw from many young people and many of my friends that somehow right-wing forces, conservative forces, racist forces had become ascendant in American society and American culture, that it seemed as if there was a feeling of melancholy and hopelessness. That the best thing that people could do was, as it quickly became clear, hashtag resist. And as I watched the Women's March the day after Trump was inaugurated in 2017, I began to think much of our conversation is about either returning to normal or resisting the present. Why don't we have a richer, deeper, more vibrant understanding of possibility. And so as I began to think about this, I began to naturally think about the question of utopia. But I knew that utopia was filled with a history of violence, totalitarianism, oppression. And here we think of political utopias realized in, for instance, the Soviet Union or in Maoist China. But I wondered, is it possible to retrieve a notion of utopianism that is critical, that is democratic, that offers a vision of hope and possibility that can actually animate the way we think about the present and imagine the future? So as a scholar of African-American history, African-American political thought, 
I began to explore this question of utopia. And some of the first work that I actually encountered, even though I never wrote about directly, was Jean-Michel Basquiat's murals and art. And the thing that really made me feel enlivened was when I saw these beautiful graffiti paintings that at once explored a possibility of a future in which black citizens and all citizens were free from the scourge of white supremacy. But at the same time, as Basquiat tried to show in his work, it was important to attend to history, to attend to the limitations of dreaming about the future. And so I began the research with an eye to ask this question, how can we begin to think about utopia not as a stale concept, but as a concept that encourage us, encourages us to feel alive, to feel connected, to feel like democratic change is possible, to feel like the past need not be prologue. And so as I began to explore the various literary and political texts, I began to see various strains. I began to see many of the strains that Sam and Sarah so eloquently described in this beautiful artwork that they just presented. And these are the strains of, first, grappling with a sense of history. One of the core questions of Black utopian thinkers and artists is how do Black citizens, given their experience of racism, white supremacy globally, given the fact that they've been excised from the historical record. How do they not only imagine themselves in that historical record, but create a story that's truly theirs? So this became a puzzle of Black utopian thought. When we imagine, for instance, Black nationalist experience, experiments, Martin Delaney was a Black nationalist thinker who advocated for Black Americans in the 1850s to move to Liberia, to actually move to Canada, to move to Cuba. Why was Delaney concerned with unpacking and rewriting history? Similarly, W.B. Du Bois in Dark Princess, it's a novel in which he tries to understand what it's like to experience blackness in the United States, but also to connect with other non-white citizens throughout the world. Du Bois was trying to ask a question, how do we relate to history? How do we think about history in a way that isn't necessarily constraining, that opens up a space of possibility? And so as I began to explore the way Black utopian thinkers thought about history, I also began to see their lively images of freedom, equality, justice, democracy, that in many ways went in stark opposition to what I call Euro-modern representations of those ideals. So for instance, if you look at many classic white European utopian texts, what you see is this romance with purity, an idea that somehow perfection can be realized, that the struggles in the world can be resolved through a realization of a perfect community, whether it's socialism, whether it's an intentional community, whether it is communism and so on. But what was so striking about these black utopian thinkers was at the same time as they were trying to imagine a different world, they were also deeply attentive to power, identity, the various limitations that structure our ability to be free. And so I became fascinated by the way that in many ways, Black utopian reflection was not simply about the future, it was about the present. And it offered a really rich space for us to think about what does it mean to be free? What is democracy? What is justice? Because that became the question that many of these Black utopian thinkers were grappling with. So as I started to go deeper into the project and read Black science fiction, Samuel Delaney's Triton, Octavia Butler's Parable series. As I became more and more immersed in the research, I recognized that many of the insights and contributions that they were offering 
weren't only serviceable and useful for Black Americans, but were incredibly useful for the very project of democracy itself. And so rather than think about these artists and writers as reflecting on the Black experience only, it became clear that they held some valuable lessons for what works and what doesn't work in democracy. And if we are to achieve a democracy in the United States and globally, we need to attend to these Black utopian ideas. So what are some of the insights that they bring forward? The first is that the system of competitiveness and individualism under capitalism simply fails, or it succeeds by virtue of creating massive inequality between the haves and have nots. And it makes it very difficult for ordinary citizens to achieve a certain degree of freedom. Their next insight is that progress and time ought to be understood not in a linear way, as Sam pointed out, but through ebbs and flows, through backs and forth. And that is one of the great contributions that they make. When we think about the present and the future, we can't assume that we're somehow moving in a positive direction at all times. What matters is that citizens are invested in struggle. They care about the world. They invest their heart, their soul into the world to make it better. The next point that they make is that community itself is contested and is subject to renegotiation. Much of the Euro modern tradition, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Diderot, Thomas More, assumes that community is perfectly realized and that the goal of utopia is to enrich and make that community whole. Black utopians understand, given the history of racism and white supremacy, that the community itself deeply depends on its members. What are the various risks? What are the various struggles that citizens are prepared to undergo? If we want to talk about a future, so say Black utopians, it's crucial to understand what our commitments are and to evaluate them and to assess them constantly. Otherwise, they believe, will just be replicating all of the hierarchies that exist in our contemporary dystopia into this future utopian space. The other thing that utopians are deeply skeptical of is the idea that somehow science and technology offer a certain kind of liberatory experience. One of the key texts here is George Schuyler's Black No More, which is a satirical novel written in 1930 that imagines what would happen if black citizens would somehow be able to go undergo um, a whiteification process. They sit in chairs and then their black skin becomes white. And Schuyler's point throughout the book is that it doesn't matter if this process would occur. Science can't save Americans from white supremacy. If blackness is gone and everyone quote unquote becomes white, there will still be an incentive to create racism. There will be new ways to demonize people of color. There will be an anxiety about who is truly white and who was previously black. And so one of the things that black utopians are sensitive to is that science and technology don't create a space of possibility. They may create the false promise of some kind of hope. But the core question is engaging in a moral conversation around what the community is and how it ought to be structured. Broadly speaking, these are the core elements of utopian thinking, specifically Black utopian thinking, around all of these ideas. And I think the question for us in many ways is not so much is Black utopia realizable? Is it possible to achieve a utopian space in the world? But instead, can we use these texts and thinkers to help deal with the injustices today? To think about Black utopia as a tool for understanding how to deal with environmental racism to deal with economic inequality, with police brutality, gender inequality, transphobia, anti-gay attitudes, 
all of this is something that can be powerfully addressed and reconsidered in a democratic and emancipatory way through the work of Black utopians. So this is, in my view, what the book is about, what I think its core contributions are. And I'd be happy to discuss with Sarah and Sam and then with the audience your thoughts about the art or any of the things that I just said. Thank you, Alex and Sam and I are now kind of joining the conversation again. That was that was so succinct, but so powerful to hear you talk across such a span of time, different ideas and um, bring it bring it together. I wrote down a lot, so we'll try to go into go into some of this in connection to, I guess, what the some of the content of the exhibitions that Sam and I have worked on and. Um, one of the places that is really connected to the Cordova is, is like Walden Pond and the history of transcendentalism and the connection of those writers and thinkers to, to, you, to a kind of personal utopianism, I guess, to a degree. And so the question is, um, an, a writer like Martin Delaney, who's you know living at the same time, or other Black utopian writers of the mid 19th century, were they in dialogue, personal dialogue, or in connection to a writer's like Emerson or Thoreau, are there connections to um, quote unquote white versus black utopian theorists? And that is um, not quote, but, and so were, you know, were they in, dis in discourse, I guess, in that? In yeah, that I, I, that's, that's a fantastic question. I think it's important because, you know, Brook Farm and many of the uh, phalanxes, the Fourier colonies came into existence in the 1840s with this promise that somehow perfect organization in small enclaves would lead to a kind of socialist revolution. And so in many ways, that project of transcendentalism was linked to the idea that somehow the perfect reorganization of space would somehow create possibility that citizens had never seen before. That to me is representative of a kind of Euro modern position of utopianism, which believes that the core problem to be overcome is a society that doesn't allow for individual flourishing, that doesn't allow for the creative expression. In Brook Farm, many of the nights were dedicated to reading poetry, reading Spinoza, dancing. All of these activities, which many of the transcendentalists thought were missing from mass society. Black utopians had a decidedly political project. And this is very important because race was always a political experience that determined black exclusion through the law. And so when Delaney imagines his black utopia, it's a utopia in which black people are engaged in various industries are engaged in various productive labor to build up a community. But when he fictionalizes it in his famous and probably first black science fiction book called Blake or the Huts of Africa, published in 1859, the whole premise of the book is a rebellion, a global enslaved rebellion that is about structuring a new black community that resists unjust laws, that resists patriarchy, that resists violence in all forms. And so if you compare the transcendentalists who were much more interested in this kind of personal and individualistic question of self-expression, and all they wanted was a perfect space to realize that, Black utopians were much more interested in a fundamental reconfiguration of political systems and laws that prevented Black citizens from realizing a future of their own making. 
did to your knowledge were was someone like Delaney in New England was he intersecting even in person or through writings with some of these with some of these contemporaries or um, not necessarily you know Delaney had a, a really interesting career because he served in the Union Army he was a general during the Civil War he was also uh, actually the connection here, interestingly, was he was one of the first black men to be accepted into Harvard Medical School, but ultimately he did not attend because of racism. He only lasted for a year there. So he was a physician. He was a general. Strikingly, toward the end of his life, he became affiliated with white supremacists because in his view, he thought that the only way to pragmatically achieve some kind of black freedom in the wake of the Civil War was by aligning himself with certain kinds of white supremacists who opposed Reconstruction, because in his view, that was the only legitimate and acceptable position given black experience in the United States. Now, that was something that was deeply troubling to Frederick Douglass, who believed that there was a way to kind of realize Delaney's critical democratic spirit without consorting with reactionaries and white supremacists. But on some level, I think the key point of comparison between someone like Martin Delaney and Thoreau and Emerson is how do they imagine the role of individual freedom? And for Delaney, the structuring experience of race and racism in the United States had a profound impact on Black creativity and Black freedom that Black people needed to reckon with, needed to grapple with. And so that was something that came out in the art, in the writing, in the poetry, in the politics. Whereas I think the implicit criticism of Thoreau and Emerson was that both of them could simply withdraw. Emerson could go and give speeches declaring the importance of self-reliance, which after all was about becoming artistic. That's why Nietzsche appreciated Emerson so much. And on the other hand, you had Thoreau who thought the greatest act of resistance was refusing to pay a certain kind of poll tax in 1846 and that that was a protest. For Delaney, the sense of being embodied in a society that even prevented you as a black citizen from thinking about freedom and utopia was something that determined how Delaney would dream about the future. And for him, it could never be an individualistic project of self-expression. It needed to be connected to the community. And that's why you see this in the artwork. I mean, I think that what was incredible about your descriptions was it's that sense of community. It's that sense of the whole society. And the work, Black Utopian artwork, tries to incorporate and respond to these dilemmas of living in a society that structures your imagination if you're a Black citizen, right? So that push and pull. Um, the distinction that is sort of emerging between some of the black thinkers that we've described and some of the the sort of European origin ones that we were talking about um, between sort of like deep deep systemic structural change versus using your own life as the sort of the microcosm sort of a more surface level you know or individual um, change that doesn't affect deep deep structures I wouldn't have thought this if we weren't talking to you, Alex, but because I know that you're a very deep reader of, of Marxist theory, I just wonder, it that does seem to be something sort of Marxist, a sort of superstructure and a base structure type thing. And I just wonder, was, was Marx actually an, an influence on some of the black thinkers that you're describing? Or was there actually a not European, but actually like a black Marx basically? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the closest figure to this would probably be Du Bois in the, the teens, you know? And there were, of course, Black socialists who were engaging these questions. But I think what makes Du Bois, and specifically the text that I work on, The Comet, where Du Bois imagines what would happen if the two living survivors 
after a comet decimates New York City and the world are a black man and a white woman. It's, it's a remarkable story that you can find in Darkwater. And Du Bois is asking this question, how is race and intimacy and vulnerability and the future of love imagined in the space where, at least in theory, race shouldn't be the defining feature? And what he finds is that their class structure, the fact that the white protagonist is a woman of means who's wealthy and the black protagonist is a black worker. For Du Bois, there's something of a glimmer of possibility that they can have solidarity, love, intimacy that's defined by mutuality, respect, justice. But for Du Bois, and this is when he's kind of moving in his really Marxist phase by the 1920s, he ends the story with a note of pessimism where class triumphs the possibility or triumphs over the possibility of interracial intimacy. So I try to recover that spirit of hope and possibility while also acknowledging the way that these class dynamics and these structures of power, according to black utopian thinkers, always haunt any project, any aesthetic or political project. And so what you see at the end of the comet is as they're embracing Jim and Julie are the two characters, her husband, a white man comes out and he's wealthy. He comes with Julia's father and he arrives and immediately assumes that Jim, the black man is engaging in sexual violence toward her. And at that moment, he is literally about to lynch Jim and a crowd erupts. And Du Bois, I think, is trying to say that on some level, all attempts to grapple with utopia and possibility need to deal with class and power. You can't simply go out to Walden Pond. You can't simply go to a space, you know, a room of your own or whatever, and practice a personal utopia. Because what ends up happening there is you have betrayed all of the power structures that will continue to impinge upon you and everyone else. And so I think that that's an important, important dynamic that Black utopian thinkers stress over and over. Um, I had another question that moves in a slightly different direction, but it picks up on something that you mentioned in terms of sort of thinking, well, trans historically, basically, yeah. sort of like the possibility that the future is speaking to us now or that the present is, is, is you know, responding to the past rather than vice versa, sort of against a sort of a, I think you're a European sort of enlightenment idea of progression or progress or history. Um, so, and specifically about intergenerational dialogue and time. So Sarah mentioned the video by the, um, the artist Tourmaline, um, I showed some examples of work by Gary Rickson, the Napoleon Jones Henderson, and Sharon Dunn, who were consciously working outside of linear narratives and timelines, um, but also generations here, like knowing that they also are like have a, mentorship is a big part of their practice and, and, and sort of thinking about their ancestors is, is really important to their artwork, that, that generations seem to be communicating across centuries and sometimes the past, you know, communicating to the future or vice versa. So is that sense of non-linear time specific to an Afrofuturist tradition? Um, does it, or, you know, which I think of as sort of like the 90s or something does, to the present, does it have earlier roots? Yes, absolutely. So for instance, you know, you can go back to Delaney and see the way that he's kind of grappling with, as I pointed out, the problem of history. The reason why Delaney is so interested in part later on in his life to find uh, an expedition mission to go to Liberia is because he's concerned with this notion of what is uh, an African identity. Can it be pure? What does it even mean? Richard Wright takes up this question explicitly in Black Power when he, in the 1950s, 1960s, goes to Ghana amidst the liberation movement movements, where Kwame Nkrumah is a popular leader who is inspiring generations of 
African citizens to think about Pan-Africanism, to think about socialism, but more importantly, to think about black identity. And Wright is skeptical of this project because speaking of Marxism, Wright is by you know, sensibility and by analysis a Marxist. But he goes to Ghana and he's struck by all of these things that he sees. He sees various traditions. He sees various mythologies that don't connect to a kind of Western sensibility that he's used to. And in his mind, he wants to denigrate it because he thinks it's irrational. He thinks it's unreasonable. He thinks it runs counter to the interests of the working class and of the kind of, you know, black citizens, black workers um, abroad. But he can't help but be moved by the various dancing that he sees. He can't help but feel um, intrigued by various stories of community that oppose Western individualism, that emphasize a holistic approach to the past, but also to community. And so Wright himself, despite his best intentions, is struck by this alternative history that he himself wasn't familiar with. And it leads to a kind of process through which he comes to think about his own convictions in reason and progress and linear time. But I think another great example is Sun Ra. Sun Ra, as the avant-garde jazz musician, despite telling the story over and over that at some point in his life, he was abducted and sent to Saturn, he, in positing this future, he always would return to a past, an Egyptian past, a past that was not constrained by white supremacy. Everything from his aesthetic, how he would dress in concert, how he would talk, he would have language classes at the University of California, Berkeley, where he would try to come up with his own language that would synthesize elements from kind of ancient history and the present and create new dialects. So this project of being an archivist, as well as a dreamer of future worlds, the synthesis between the past and the present is something that I think Black utopians are especially concerned with. Whereas in the Euromodern tradition, there is a kind of um, looking forward, or to put it differently, one of the classic Euromodern texts is actually called Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. This is 1888. But he's talking about looking backward as if it was a past to be avoided because the future is what matters. You know, he's, he's writing from the future to the past, to the present. So that's an important perspective shift. And I think that this kind of speaks to a broader question. You know, Black culture, Black history is concerned with kind of showing the way the present and the past are overlapping. Whereas a certain version of kind of white American amnesia is about assuming that the past is always behind us. Whereas, you know, in Toni Morrison's classic text, Beloved, she even has a term called rememory. There's a fusion of past, present, future. And that runs deeply counter to a vision of the present that is divorced from history, constraint, but also from one's ancestors. So I think all of that is a crucial part of the Black utopian tradition. That, that's so beautifully put. And I just wanted to mention that I was, I really wanted Sun Ra to be in the exhibition in some way. And because I had, we had that parameter of Massachusetts, I, he's not, but someone, a friend told me that, um, so Sun Ra's saxophonist and bassist, Pat Patrick, is Deval Patrick, the Massachusetts governor's father. So <laughs> oh, wow, wow, the wow. link is there. It's all, it, it's really all connected. That's really interesting. Wow, wow. It's so interesting to hear you talk as well, because one of the works in Transcendental Modernism, the reproduction of the mural um, by Gary Rickson called Africa is the Beginning, um, you may not have noticed, but it is a depiction of a landscape where a per, like an Egyptian pyramid is sort of set within what could be almost like a lunar landscape. So it sort of presents this kind of um, blank slate landscape 
an Egyptian pyramid below which it says the words Africa is the beginning. So that idea of temporality where like time is beginning in a place where um, time is in temporality is in the past, that civilization in a place that is um, outer space, but also placed in Egypt and in an African sense in that way, I think all those things really align the Bellamy, we have, do have a copy of Bellamy's book, the men what you oh, mentioned really? in Visionary New England too. So it's so um, revealing. And I uh, honestly wish I had learned and talked more with you in advance of working on this show because there are so many more ways in which um, I would have placed greater emphasis, I think on some of the narratives you're describing um, and really next to each other as well to mm -hmm. kind of draw out um, these, these many, many voices of their mm -hmm. times. Um, I want to open, give a set, you know, we're coming up on almost an hour. There haven't been yet too many questions, but there is a few and I'm very welcome. We very much welcome people to chime in. Um, one, one is coming from Anya. So in your research, have you found communities who are successfully executing these philosophies already? So places where utopian thought, black utopian thought is lived, I guess, in a way, or mm -hmm. other, you can answer that in another way, I guess, but that's how I read that question. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, a, a postdoctoral researcher um, who um, I've been working with, she is doing a project right now on the Black Freedom uh, Georgia Initiative. So just this past year during COVID, three Black feminists bought a piece of land in Georgia and have tried to create a, a space that incorporates many of these themes. One of creative expression, but also of racial solidarity, also thinking about different patterns and structures of community, nurturing, but dealing explicitly with questions of power. And I think that that is incredibly important because often utopia assumes that somehow all that's needed is an escape. All that's needed is an escape and then everything will kind of fall into place. And once you posit your ideal, all of the contradictions, all of the messiness, all of the tragedy will somehow disappear over time. Right? And this is connected to this telos of history, this linearity. Whereas even in their mission statement, they talk about the importance of seeing community itself as a struggle, a working through. So there are elements of kind of psychoanalysis. There are elements of a much more kind of fragile, but I would say a hopeful notion of future, which is about working to fully address and deal with all of the injustices and violence in the past and present. That's very, very interesting. I mean, that idea of utopia as never something realized, always changing, always um, unfixed, I think is something I also relate to some of the artists in visionary New England who identify as queer as well. So I think there's this intersection in terms of um, the mutability of a space where it felt like a space of endless possibility um, where that in terms of gen gender or sexuality in other ways um, feel possible for some of the artists at least in visionary so I was just thinking about that as you were speaking in terms of um, historic examples that example that the artist tourmaline um, turns to the Seneca village um, community have you done research into that um, that group of um, people, citizens that lived there or pe a population and the story that of its um, of, of their um, moving out uh, due to de imminent domain that happened afterwards? No, I mean, you know, what's one of the things that that's really remarkable is, you know, as you know, I finished the book and thought about all this, you know, I, I thought about trying to find many of these communities, but part of it is they're often hidden from the record because of these very problems and dilemmas that utopians are trying to work through. You know, it's, it's hard to kind of find a book on this community or to find something more than a passing reference. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I found really interesting and important was these literary and artistic texts become some of the most durable and clear meditations on utopia 
even though they don't take the kind of standard form that we associate with a manifesto, Thomas More, that we associate with, you know, the communist manifesto. And I really was interested in looking at this as an archive of imaginative thought that was trying to exist in a space where it wasn't allowed, trying to find room to create an archive, uh, an artifact that is almost impossible, right? And so it was a challenge for me, but ever since I wrote the book, I've heard so many um, folks kind of giving me uh, insight into these actually existing communities and yeah. um, I, I keep learning about them. So I, I didn't do research, but um, I, 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 I'm curious to learn more. Yeah. Sam, do you have any other um, questions or from the audience or, you know, coming up on a, the end of the time? I think I had a question, Sam, if you're not, I don't know if Sam may be frozen. There we go. Um, oh, no, 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 go, go for it. This, it's actually more about your current book. So um, a book titled Against Civility. And so in a, do you have a way of summarizing, just sharing with us what the content of this book um, is really the thrust of it. And also does it have connections in some ways to this Lockutopia topic that um, wasn't you know, that long ago in terms of your research? Yeah, yeah. So, so this, this book sort of was really animated after I finished Black Utopia. And the question that I was kind of really trying to, to answer, and this is a question that you just raised was, what are the concrete strategies and practices through which liberation is actually achieved? So on the one hand, I wanted to expand our imagination of possibility by turning to black utopian art and culture. But I also wanted to have something of a historical archive to understand what kind of strategies concretely work to facilitate uh, an anti-racist politics. And what I saw circulating in around 2018 was this turn towards civility, that if only we sit down, have conversations across the aisle, that somehow racial justice would be around the corner. But I began to think about all that I learned from Black Utopia, and I wondered to what extent does civility as a concept, as an idea, actually promote injustice and violence. At the same time, what is the actual historical alternative to civility? And what I found was, if you look throughout history, civility is being used to silence, police, repress black citizens with much more regularity than it is used to liberate them. And this was kind of connected to this question of why were all these black utopians concerned with utopia and dystopia? It's because at every twist and turn, they were being regulated and marginalized and policed through what they could and could not say. And yet it was only when they broke the boundaries of respectability and decorum that they were taken seriously and that history changed. So I tracked various figures from Frederick Douglass to Ida B. Wells to Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Every single anti-racist figure, every single figure who was concerned with racial justice abandoned civility. Because for them, civility was a tool of repression and silence. And it never worked. And so I wrote this not knowing that Joe Biden would become president, no idea what the future would hold. But I think this topic became timelier as Joe Biden began to mobilize a sort of conversation around unity and reconciliation and taking from my study of the black tradition and black political thought, I knew that opposition and disruption and an unapologetic defense of the future and of hope 
was the only way that elites would make concessions to the anti-racist movement. And so that was what kind of motivated it. And um, I wanted to kind of change the conversation around what are the norms that we should defend and how those norms can actually be counterproductive to the project of racial justice. Interesting. Um, Sam, do you have, by way of conclusion, anything else you'd like to share or add? No, but that's actually really interesting to start to think through a lot of the art practices in visionary New England and transcendental modernism in terms of civility versus disruption. There's an interesting balance. I don't know. Some of the, some of those artists and figures have one foot in both in both places. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, totally. Mm -hmm. Not to mention many, some of the artists whom we didn't discuss who are, I consider them performing a kind of historic reenactment, like in the magical sense, um, are doing that exactly for the reasons you described that histories that they're interested in don't exist in an archival form or record. And so mm -hmm. they have to reanimate a world, whether it's a different legacies of different people who have been marginalized throughout history in a, their own deliberate way. And that is a very deliberate, I would say, contemporary art practice right now. So I find that so interesting in connection to the subject of your book and also our contemporary moment um, of being needing to be present to be concerned with issues of social justice now, but really concerned also with this um, excavation, I guess, in a, to a degree. So Alex, thank you so, so much. Thank you. We're, we're, delighted and just getting started, I think, with so much thought around um, what you've just described. So um, we'll conclude now, but um, thank you for bringing all that you did to just a short conversation and um, and follow up with us um, through through the trustees, through to Cordova, if anyone has questions or thoughts or remarks, we are really welcome and open to hearing from other people about the programs we share. And so hope thank you, Sarah. Time. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. It was such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you all.